Welcome back, everybody, to Post Wrestling. It is John Pollock here with you, and our guest today, a name synonymous with wrestling history, a writer for countless outlets, including a very lengthy tenure with WWF Magazine. He is also the man behind the critically acclaimed biographies for the likes of Classy Freddie Blassie, superstar Billy Graham, and his latest work is Too Sweet, Inside the Indie Wrestling Revolution that's available now through ECW Press. It is my pleasure to be joined by Keith Elliott, Greenberg and Keith, uh, thank you so much for joining us here at Post Wrestling today. Hey, thank you, John, for inviting me. I wanted to start off um, listing off, you know, you've put together some of the best wrestling biographies that have come out with this project where you're covering an entire scene and a huge period in time. Uh, tell me a little bit about the difficulty of that process as opposed to a singular subject that, I mean, this is so uh, wide and encompassing that you tried to touch on so much in this uh, in, in terms of where the independents are. Right. And, you know, when I'm co-authoring an autobiography, it's one person telling me uh, his or her story. Uh, this is an entirely different thing. This is not someone handing a story to me and me um, organizing it in a way that it's readable. Not to say that uh, tackling someone's autobiography is an easy task, but it's a different type of task. In this case, I was trying to create a snapshot of indie wrestling today of an evolving scene and of the history that led to where we are today, which is a daunting task. And I believe in chapter two, I apologize to those I didn't include in the book because it would be impossible to include every indie and every indie wrestler in a 300 page book. But my intention is to give the viewers and oh, the viewers, the readers an overview of what is going on today and how we got here. And it's interesting. I speak to lapsed wrestling fans and they really don't know about the indie wrestling revolution. They know a couple of major WWE names and otherwise they haven't paid attention. And they know there's something on TNT and Chris Jericho is involved. And that's about the extent of it. So this is a place to go to, uh, you know, see where we are and how we got here. I thought it was such a, an interesting comparison point that, I mean, you are one of the few people that can state that you, you know, two years ago, you walked out of All In, and what came to mind was you attending the very first WrestleMania in 1985. At, at what point in the, the lead up to All In and maybe even the event itself, did it really dawn on you that this was something more than just a wrestling show, just, you know, we see so many big events that come and go. Where where did it start for you that this was indicative of something, the beginning points of something larger? <clears throat> Excuse me. When I first started working on this book, I did not know AEW would be created. Um, All In had pretty much been the pinnacle of the indie wrestling revolution. In fact, I thought that might be the climax of the book. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there had been that bet between Dave Meltzer of the Wrestling Observer Newsletter and Cody that no independent wrestling promotion could uh, draw 10,000 fans or more and all in prove that that was a fallacy. And I thought that might be it. That might be the end of the book. And then we'd go on to, you know, see where the indie scene went afterwards and realize at the time all in was working. They worked with Ring of Honor. So Ring of Honor, for all intents and purposes, seemed to be the number two promotion in North America. They had deals with um, uh, the, uh, pr uh, Revolution Pro in the UK, uh, CMLL in Mexico, and the um, New Japan. So uh, that seemed to be, you know, they, there were international connections, and it seemed like, you know, and that's a pretty good number two, you know, given the, the wide breadth that it tackled. Um, as I was working on this book, I was talking to indie wrestlers hanging out in indie dressing rooms, and these guys started to get signed. Some guys got like Dan Math got signed to Ring of Honor, and guys like Joey Janela and Jungle Boy, they got signed to, um, to AEW, and suddenly there was something new happening, and uh, the indie scene was evolving even further than I'd envisioned it. And it's you know, we are in the midst of it now that when you have 
a company like an AEW and we see, you know, just the numbers that NXT has added to their roster over the last number of years that the, the window for an independent performer, is it going, is that window going to be closing where it may have taken you eight to 10 years to get that big contract today? That might be two, three years and suddenly you get a buzz about yourself and it's an arms race and talent are in, in very much high demand. Well, you know, uh, th- that's that's a great question, and I'd like to look at it in the most optimistic light possible, and I would say that um, there's a lot of great talent out there, and there's a lot of people with dreams out there. There's a quote in the book, Adam Cole gets signed by NXT and an MJF steps up, mm-hmm. and now MJF was just in the main event at uh, All, All Out. And uh, there are plenty of aspiring MJFs out there. And there are probably kids in high school who watched that match and said, I want to be the next MJF or John Moxley. And they're, you know, going along that path. So I'd like to believe that um, there will always be the talent that's been inspired uh, by those who came before. For yourself as a reporter tackling this um, entire movement of independent wrestling, how um – how open were a lot of these companies? It seemed like they, many of them opened the doors to you and, you know, you have independent talent that, you know, any kind of coverage they, they welcome. How was that for you in, you know, an industry that I certainly don't need to tell you can be, you know, very closed off at times, but it seems on the independent level, they're, they're looking for that spotlight and you seem to have tremendous access throughout this. Well, it, it was refreshing. And I've been in those dressing rooms where everything is, uh, paranoid and um, everything is secretive and you know people within the company don't know what the company is really doing and talent might be coming in or going out and nobody knows and everything is gossip and rumors that was not the scene that I completely encountered now I was backstage at final battle at the end of 2018 the night that Cody and the Bucks and, uh, and, and Hangman Page, uh, all the, uh, and, uh, SCU mm-hmm. all said their goodbyes. And, um, I remember observing those guys backstage uh, when the show was, uh, before the show started and, you know, seeing Marty Skrull chatting with, uh, you know, the, uh, COO of Ring of Honor very easily and Cody interacting with the other talent. And, you know, I was trying to discern, OK, who's staying, who's leaving. And although I'm sure there must have been tension backstage because, you know, there were probably people who were resentful, like, how can you do this to the company that's giving you guys this forum? And or maybe there were people who were like, how come you didn't take me with you? I heard a rumor about somebody who makes wrestling rings who was upset that he wasn't um going to give be, be given a chance to make the wrestling rings for the new promotion that was rumored to start <laughs> um but i didn't feel a negative vibe back there people weren't jumpy people weren't skittish so something was on the horizon and it didn't seem i it, the tension was lacking and i had been in very tense dressing rooms before. So, you know, it's Ring of Honor. It's such an interesting decision that they make because at that time, I mean, they had the the Bucks and Cody and Hangman. They're all under deals. And okay, for, all, okay. yeah. Yeah, for all of them, like they did have to get the blessing of Ring of Honor uh, to do all in. If they go the traditional route and just say, no, that is not happening. Do you think ultimately that it's, it's ultimately the same outcome that they leave the company at the end of the year. They pursue their own, uh, whatever AEW would become. Or do you think that all in not happening might have had a, a big ripple effect in terms of what we're talking about today? You know, there, there's always a lot of what ifs. Had AEW not happened, and I'm sorry, you said had, had all in not happened, I'm not sure we would uh, be where we are today. Likewise, Um, There was a period when AJ Styles and um, Gallows and um, Anderson and Shinsuke Nakamura all jumped ship from New Japan and Ring of Honor and went over to um, went over to WWE. Uh, AJ Styles, and this pointed out in the book, 
had a conversation with the Young Bucks prior to leaving. And the Young Bucks said, we just re-upped our contract uh, with, with Ring of Honor. We're not going anywhere. Had that not happened, had the timing been off by, say, a month, mm -hmm. the Young Bucks might have gone to WWE at that time. And then you would have had Kenny Omega and Cody Rhodes and, uh, you know, SCU, and maybe that wouldn't have been enough. Um, certainly Cody Rhodes had a dream of what he wanted to create, uh, but without Tony Khan coming in and seeing the talent that he could showcase – I'm not sure any of this would, would go on. Uh, one day, I guess I'll have to ask Tony Khan about it personally. I love playing What If, Keith. I think it's the most uh, fun, fun game to, to look at. And just uh, like we knew that, that Tony already had planted the seeds of a wrestling company. But I just wonder if you take out all in and for the Young Bucks, for instance, like maybe they don't stay with Ring of Honor. But do they have that confidence that this can work and they just take the, the guaranteed offer with WWE, it's like that event being in that arena, which I was as well, like you could, I, I think you walk away from that seeing like this could be very viable, but if it was just a theoretical, who, who's to say? Yeah, and you know, I can recall right up until the creation of AEW, chatting with friends and saying, look, the bottom line is this, even if, a guy, if guys put on a great match at the Tokyo Dome, if Vince wants them, Vince will get them. And that seemed to be the prevailing uh, logic in the wrestling world. WWE was the number one company. Then there was a line. Then there was everybody else. And the um, emergence of the Khan family in the wrestling business suddenly created choices. Now, there was a vibrant indie scene. And that indie scene was flourishing. And it would still be flourishing. But without that choice of a very viable number two, where you could get comparable money and you could get what guys are calling creative freedom, we'd be in a very different place right now. Now, uh, take us a little bit behind the scenes uh, to like, where is your deadline in all of this as 2019 is unfolding? And I would be really conflicted of like, where where do we hit the end point here for this project? Because Everything is changing at such a, a fast pace. I imagine for you that if you thought all in might have been the culmination and then 2019 happens. Well, that, that, once again, John, that's another really great question. Um, and it, it shows that you understand the pressures that a writer feels because you deal with it yourself every day. Um, you know, I knew there had to be a cutoff point, And I say this at the end of the book. Um, and so I decided to make the cutoff point because they wanted a book. They wanted to get a book out there. I could not have taken the luxury and just, you know, luxuriated while everything continued to unfold. Mm -hmm. So two days before the first AEW taping, I was in Asbury Park, New Jersey for a Game Changer wrestling show at the appropriately named House of Independence. And Joey Janela, Jungle Boy, Orange Cassidy, and Marco Stunt were all on that card, along with referee Bryce Remsburg. And then they were all going to the inaugural AEW taping two days later. And I thought, this is the cutoff point. It's so long to the independents as we knew them, and a new chapter is about to begin. I made that the cutoff point. And as I say in the epilogue, the story isn't over. A new chapter's begun, and that's why I'm writing a sequel right now. And you, you bring up that scene, and you illustrated it so well in the book. Like you, it's just such a, a beautiful picture of these guys leaving the House of Independence to get into their car and then drive to the Capital One Center in Washington D.C. Like it is a a great metaphor of these talents that all of a sudden, like this is a result of what we're living through right now. That they are now you know full time with AEW. Uh, Game Changer Wrestling is uh, such a fascinating company to study and learn from. And I would say today, like that is, those are the cards you want to be spotted on. Those are the ones you want to get booked on. And they have been able to take uh, such, um, take their themed shows and find undiscovered talent. And it's become like where all the eyes of the independent world are on. You get on those shows, like that's a big break in your career now. 
Right. I mean, I, I was at one of their shows in Indianapolis, an outdoor show recently. And I mean, it was, you know, fascinating. And this is the middle, not the middle of the pandemic. It was during the summertime. Uh, the fears of the pandemic were still prevalent. And a lot of these guys told me at that point they hadn't even wrestled yet. And so they were hungry to show off their skills. And I must say the crowd was very respectful of that. And the crowd probably had come from all over the Midwest to see that. And um, it was a very positive feeling. It wasn't an old school wrestling crowd that could be hostile and would um, shout out things to maybe throw the talent off when they were wrestling or just shout out ignorant things. This was a uh, intelligent re- crowd of wrestling fans that enjoyed the art of wrestling and looked at it as art. And we were v- extremely appreciative of both GCW and the talent who, who, that, that appeared. And, um, you know, it, it was it, it was exciting and it was something that was unique and um, it was emblematic of what GCW is, is they push boundaries. And in early October, these guys are going to be having another series of shows in, in Indianapolis. And these are actually these will this will compensate for the shows they were going to do this past WrestleMania weekend. And um, absolute intense wrestling from Cleveland will be there. I think black label wrestling will be there. A whole, a whole bunch of, you know, independent promotions will be cooperating. It'll be about four days of shows. And this is still October, still pandemic time, outdoor shows, people socially distanced, people wearing masks. But GCW is that one company in America that's able to pull that off. As you're tackling the sequel, uh, as we speak, I mean, there's, there's two major issues this year that directly impact the, the independent wrestling scene. And that is, of course, COVID-19. And we don't even know what the long-term effects of the industry are going to have. And also the speaking out movement. It, it, to me, those are, you know, th- this has been a pivotal year and it's one where it's going to be next year and beyond that we see the, the true effects. But I think that this has been one of those kind of uh, monumental years when it comes to assessing I- independent wrestling and the industry by and large. Well, wrestling by and large, right. Like you say, the entire industry. And obviously this is something no one could have anticipated. And uh, as I say in the epilogue, I thought, you know, I would be looking at the year 2020, which was supposed to be the best year in a generation to be a wrestling fan. And I'd look at it in the context of real world events. And I thought the real world events would be the impeachment, the American presidential election and Brexit. And those are pretty big events. No one anticipated an international pandemic. And so the professional wrestling industry has had to pivot Fortunately, because of the age of social media, some wrestlers were able to earn a living selling their merchandise online. Mm -hmm. Um, Other guys, you know, completely sidelined. I spoke to there's a tag team out of Kansas City, the Regal Twins. Great tag team. And they were, you know, working the American New Japan shows and they kind of got separated. One guy was visiting his girlfriend, the UK, and by all accounts, he's still there. So this really throws things off, you know, and um, in addition to that, I've been getting, you know, some tweets uh, after the book came out from people who said, you know, I looked through the the, the uh, center spread, all the photos. We have about 40 photos in the book and I'm seeing guys who have, were accused of heinous things during this speaking out movement. Right. And, um, you know, I had to say, look, first of all, To take them out of the book would be like to excise Chris Benoit from both uh, WWE history and New Japan history and WCW history. Um, They are part of history. That doesn't endorse what they may or may not have done. And like COVID-19, speaking out is still – the jury is still out on many of these cases – You know, none of these cases, as far as I know, have gone to court. So I'm still not certain what is legitimate and what is, um, you know, uh, a a, a, uh, grievance that 
may have been uh, expressed this way. I really don't know all the answers yet, and time will tell. You know, will some guys trickle back into the industry? Certainly. Um, so, but it's an interest. But the most important thing is it's forcing us to reevaluate the values of both the professional in wrestling industry and society as a whole. Is it right to regard women a certain way? Is it right to treat women a certain way? What has it been like for women who had the same dream as the men and wanted to be in the professional wrestling industry and had to share dressing rooms with these guys? What was it like for those women, even if they were left alone, watching the way through the years professional wrestling groupies were treated? And so, you know, in the end, this will be a positive thing. Like I spoke to Tommy Dreamer last week and he was telling me at Impact Two of the producers, Gail Kim and Madison Rain, they are female producers, formerly known as road agents backstage. So, you know, the industry is changing for the better. And just as we have now widened our taste to accept women's pro wrestling the way it was accepted in Japan, as these are legitimate athletes who often put on the best match of the show – we are also, you know, having to change our perspectives about how women are treated and how women are spoken about. And, um, you know, everybody feeling that there should be a positive experience for them. Yeah. And I think that, you know, we, we look at the, the next step of any structural changes. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's, it's things like you just mentioned, like separate dressing rooms. I think there's certainly examples that can be implemented immediately. There's other ones when we're talking about having some kind of regulatory body or uh, third parties to oversee that the independence, I mean, th this is not for, for the, by and large, largely profitable ventures like this somewhere that like the cost involved, it's very restrictive for these companies. And it becomes very difficult when you're trying to implement uh, structural changes across the board for these independents that are very much like it's the margins are very, very small for companies to make money. Right. Now, I know that in the UK, um, there, there there are, um, and I'm trying to remember whether it's Progress or um, or Rev Pro. I'm drawing a blank now. But I know that one of those promotions has now uh, put in certain protocols in place specifically to make sure that the female performers feel safe. Yeah, Progress um, did put out um, yeah. a, a whole like list of uh, new guidelines. Yeah. Right. And, you know, progress is is associated with WWE. And so uh, perhaps that's why they're able to do that. But I know even in terms of testing the talent, if you're an indie promoter, you know, your money is going to just fly the talent in. You're like going online to make sure you're on at the right time to get, you know, an inexpensive plane fare. So testing that's quite an undertaking, and sure. some indie promoters certainly can't do it. But in order for the industry to advance, we're going to have to, you know, have an industry-wide awareness at the very least that there's just some things you can't do. And look, I'm no saint. If somebody was following me around with a camera for 10 years, I'm sure that there'd be a whole speaking out movement based on ignorant things that have come out of my mouth. But, you know, let's leave that stuff in the past and look to the future. You know, maybe some of the people who've na whose names have come up in the speaking out movement, maybe they can be forgiven. Maybe they can work their ways back into the industry. Others will have to be sidelined. And let's not make the same mistakes again. Uh, just drawing back to the the book and, you know, 2018, 2019, even, even up to present day, what are some of the parallels you see to – 1984 and the WWF's national expansion as someone that was, you know, following the scene at, at the time. Do you see a lot of uh, comparisons uh, between the two and WWE's response throughout this whole thing as AEW has risen up? Uh, well, yeah, there's certainly there there's certainly parallels, and you know the parallels also have to do with the media that you have access to. You know, early late 1940s. That medium was television. People were getting televisions in their house and it made uh, the possibility of promoting wrestling to the public 
uh, very different than it had been during the days of the golden Greek Jim Londis and uh, Man Mountain Dean, who my father used to watch, I think, back in the 1930s and 40s. Um, you know, uh, WWE, you had Vince McMahon aggressively changing the rules of professional wrestling. And in this case, it's slightly different because indie wrestling has been embraced to an extent by WWE. NXT very much has an indie spirit in it. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, you also have the Khan family who have the, the resources and the context the, to, you know, get AEW on TNT. But there are different ways of disseminating your product. And, you know, in the past, if I were promoting a book, I'd have to hope that there was a radio station somewhere in Toronto that, you know, at 2 a.m. on Saturday nights did a, a 15 minute wrestling segment. Now I can come on your show and, you know, get a lot of attention for a book that I want to sell. Um, so all these different mediums mean that there are, you know, the opportunities have expanded. And as opportunities expand, the rules change. And Vince McMahon changed the rules back in 1984. Uh, WWE is still pivoting. They created, you know, I mean, cinematic matches to a degree existed before, but they have um, fortified the, the, the um, cinematic match as a bona fide wrestling genre during COVID-19. We saw the stadium stampede in AEW. We just saw the cinematic match, uh, tooth and nail match on Saturday night between Big Swole and Dr. Britt Baker. So WWE is still making those changes to the industry that others are following. We see the Thunderdome and that is, you know, technologically revolutionary. So they're making the changes. They're certainly not being left behind, but rules are also being set elsewhere. And the number one company, they're not always going to follow those rules. And so there is a chance for some choice and some divergence. And with the expansion so much now to not just television, but to, to streaming platforms, it seems like that is an avenue that's a growth potential and is going to be looking at where can we get eyeballs? Professional wrestling becomes a strong candidate. And we have seen the likes of, uh, of an MLW that recently got the deal with the zone. Like, do you see as, as streaming services continue to grow that uh, pro wrestling becomes a beneficiary with this, this trickle down effect that non WWE wrestling can certainly find an audience. Yeah. I mean, I just did an interview with fight TV, uh, with, with Matt Stryker interviewed me about the book. So again, not only is it an alternative for places to see wrestling, it's an alternative for places to talk about wrestling, for wrestling to be treated with the same reverence, the same seriousness as mainstream sports. And look, maybe WWE started the trend. WWE started WrestleMania and because of WrestleMania weekend, you have dozens of indie promotions showcasing their unique talents, their unique forums that same weekend. WWE started it, but now it is part of the wrestling culture as a whole. WWE started the WWE Network, but that doesn't preclude anybody else from streaming wrestling, nor does it preclude fans from ordering that wrestling from going to fight TV and maybe having both because there's no rule that says you can, it's either WWE or indie wrestling. You can enjoy everything. Uh, as we, as we wind down here, uh, this might sound like a, a silly question, but it's often I can see like there is a trap that some can find themselves in where they have followed the industry their entire lives and it becomes, well, wrestling, it, it's not as good as this period. And you get stuck in that trap. And that was one of my takeaways from your book that was the complete opposite. Like you are as captivated and want to learn as much as possible what's happening now with the perspective of history, but not trapped in history as well. And that's something that I think is, you know, something that 
everyone should be able to strive for because you can miss out on a lot of great stuff that's happening right now if you're only lo- looking to the past and not learning what the future holds. And look, I had to evolve to this place. You know, maybe I've written about wrestling for the last couple of decades, but, you know, at my core, I'm a wrestling fan. And everybody is locked into what they watched when they were 11 or 12 years old. And they idealize that for the rest of their lives. You know, uh, you know, you could put um, Kenny Omega and Okada in the ring and I can uh, I'll compare it to a Bruno San Martino uh, Hans Mortier match and go, Mm -hmm. I don't know. I think Bruno's match was better. Now, in reality, of course, that isn't true. But, you know, we we become. um enamored with the stuff that made us fall in love. Maybe the same way you might always romanticize an early girlfriend. Um, but you have to kind of be self-aware and work your way past that and say, all right, you know, maybe it seems so great during another period. Maybe if you were a kid during the Attitude Era, that seems to be the pinnacle of everything. But look at what else is going on. Go to a GCW show and uh, check out their attitude. And, you know, you might be pretty impressed and it might make you want to explore other types of wrestling. You know, check out what's going on in New Japan. Um, You know, there's a lot of wrestling out there. And, uh, you know, I, I think that you have to if you're going to be a wrestling fan, don't make yourself suffer. Don't nail yourself to a cross. Don't live your life going on Facebook saying it's not as good as it used to be. There's some good stuff there. Savor it. Enjoy it. Live it. Feel it. Don't make yourself miserable because you have an ideal that you think will never be met again. Uh, well, Keith, I want to give you the floor just to let people know where they can go uh, check out the book. And, and what is the status of the sequel as well? The big follow up. Good. That's a good. Thank you for giving me this forum. Um too Sweet Inside the Indie Wrestling Revolution is published by ECW Press. You could go to the ECW Press website. You'll see a lot of other great wrestling books there, including the recent Andre the Giant book and Tim Hornbaker's great um, uh, historical tomes about different eras in professional wrestling. But probably the easiest method of ordering my book is go to Amazon, type in Too Sweet, Inside the Indie Wrestling Revolution and order the book. Or if you're in a part of the world where you can, um, where bookstores are open, there's a bookstore right here in Brooklyn that's open close to me. Go in and buy it. Either way, I'm happy if, if you purchase my book. That said, my current book is analyzing professional wrestling as these eras evolve, as uh, the COVID-19 era takes place. And uh, I need people to tell me stories, people within the industry. I need fans. Uh, there's probably scenes going on that I don't know about. Uh, so uh, you can I will give you a, a, an email. Indie Wrestling Book. I-N-D-I-E Wrestling Book. One word at Gmail dot com. Indie Wrestling Book at Gmail dot com. Send me an email. If you're a wrestler, if you're a promoter. You know, what's it been like this, this, uh, the past couple of months for you? What are your plans for the future? I'd like to include it in my book, my next book. Fantastic. Keith, uh, thank you so much for this time. I really recommend this. It's such a thorough dissection of a really pivotal couple of years of just where we were two years ago this week coming off of all in, uh, compared to today. I mean, it feels like multiple lifetimes, uh, within the industry and, uh, you are the man to chronicle it. So, uh, thanks so much for taking, uh, this amount of time out to chat with us here at Post Wrestling. Thank you, John, for giving me this forum.